Well, Marquitas, we already know each other, but for those who are watching, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Anita Casavantes Bradford, and I'm an associate professor of history and Chicano Latino studies here at UCI. I am the first in my family to go to university and the first woman in my family to finish high school. Um, okay, so I'm Marquitas Presswood. I am a third year graduate student in the history department. I study uh, modern China and African American history. Uh, I am also a first generation college student. I am the first person in my family to receive a four year degree um, from a, a, a four year college. Um, also the first person to go to graduate school. So yeah, a lot of firsts for my family as well. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about your experience as, as an undergrad being a first gen student, but also more about how you decided to go to grad school and what was that, what was that like for you. So tell me when you first realized that you wanted to go to college. I think I realized that pretty late, um, and this was sometime in high school. My mother, though, was, I think she had a plan for me very early on, right, that I didn't even know about. Um, she was very big on education. I mean, at that point, she had only received her high school diploma. Mm -hmm. But she also knew that she wanted something more for, for, for me, my brother, my sister, right? So she's very engaged with our, our education and our learning. I mean, every time, you know, she would always tell teachers, hey, you have any problems with my kids? Mm -hmm. Here's my number. Give me a call. Right. I mean, she made it a point to come to the school very frequently. I mean, so people knew that, okay, this parent is engaged. Mm -hmm. And so um, we knew that a lot was expected from us, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess when I was in high school, I had one teacher, biology teacher, um, who was a graduate of, of Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually paid for me to go to visit the campus wow. uh, one spring. And uh, I went down and visit for for new student orientation, mm -hmm. not new student orientation, but potential students who wanted to go and see the campus. Mm -hmm. He paid my way to go down, bought my plane ticket, you know, hotel, all this other stuff, and wow. arranged for me to meet people and um, other students. And when I went down, you know, after that two, three day period, I was just like, yeah, this is this is where I'm coming. I'm, I'm coming here. Okay. And um, yeah, that's where it started for me, I think, where I knew I was going to college, right? And is that where you did your undergrad then at I Morehouse? I did, I did, I did. So how was that for you? That's a historically black college, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, so how was it for you being a first-gen student at Morehouse? It was interesting because um, people like to think of HBCUs as these monolithic institutions, and they're not. It's actually a very, very diverse place, mm -hmm. um, more so in terms of like socioeconomics, right? I mean, so, you know, my first year at Morehouse, I'm coming into contact with people who are not just from working class black families. I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking about, you know, black Republicans, mm -hmm. you know, you know, kids who, whose parents are like paying for school, writing checks for school, right? I mean, right. so I met a lot of black people who were outside of my circle, right? Mm. I'm coming from the inner city of Chicago. Um, to see all these upper middle class black folk and just a different way of being, right? They, they, their, their lives were different. The stories they, they talked about, they were different from my stories. And mm -hmm. so um, just a really diverse group of um, young men and very smart, mm -hmm. very intelligent. I mean, uh, um, already read half the books, some of them, you know, when we got to class. And so it was also intimidating. You know, I was a first gen student. Mm -hmm. You know, my high school, as much as they helped, it didn't prepare me for the rigors of college, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it took a, a couple of years to really get adjusted and to really start to be able not only to just catch up mm -hmm. and then to compete um, with those those students. But I think Morehouse um, was a very safe space for that to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, a lot of the students were very encouraging, you know, and hey, did you do your work, your, your homework, you need some help, let me help you with that, you know? Mm -hmm. We used to always have the saying, are you tight? Yeah. And, and what we meant was that, you know, hey, are you ready for that presentation? Are you ready for the homework? Are you ready for the test? I mean, so everyone was very encouraging. There was a very good sense of community and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in those first couple of years, as you're adjusting, you're trying to figure out how to be a student, um, what, what did you learn? What worked for you? What helped you to succeed? Um, I realized that I had to put more time in. You know, I wasn't spending enough time with the material. Mm. I wasn't 
talking about it enough, you know, uh, to really let it sink in. So I think what I realized what I had to do was that I had to swallow my pride hmm. and I had to learn to depend on other people as well and to get help, right? Like there are these spaces where you can go and get help and, and, and to, to be able to be vulnerable and admit that there are things I don't know and I need some help. Mm -hmm. And so um, this was a very safe space for that. Um, and there were a lot of people who were uh, very helpful in, in, in that process. So that's Fantastic. what I think I learned. Yeah. What about your relationships with professors? Um, so it was a small liberal arts college, right? And you know, at that time, I think a little less than 3,000 students. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a pretty um, good ratio, you know, uh, student teacher ratio, right? So um, it was no problem to go to a professor's office hours. Um, some students actually went out to a bar drinking with professors. I mean, that was quite common, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're very approachable, very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of students have very good relationships um, with professors on campus. You know, and that's usual for a small liberal arts college, right? It was no different than, than other, you know, small colleges of that size, right? So UCI obviously is very different. Uh, right? Extremely different. We're such a such a big university. Um, UCI has a fairly small black undergraduate student population. Um, about 50% of our African American students, undergrads, are also first gen. So what would your sort of words of advice be for African American first gen kids at UCI confronting a totally different yeah. environment from the one that you dealt with as an undergrad? Right. Um, I think the first thing is, I mean, know yourself, you know, I mean, you know what you need help on, right? Mm -hmm. You know what you need help with. And you have to, again, be humble and be willing to go and find those safe spaces where you can get some help. Mm -hmm. But that requires you, you know, again, you know, being able to admit to yourself that I have to get help in these spaces, right? And I have to go and find where I can get, and that's probably the problem with UCI is that it's so big, mm -hmm. you don't know where to go to look for this kind of help and assistance, right? So you have to figure out, okay, who are my, my allies and who, who's gonna help me with this, navigate this process, right? And that can be the daunting task mm -hmm. for most undergraduates, right? So how do you find that, speaking more in specific terms? I think first you have to network with other students, particularly students who are upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to find a network of professors who have a reputation for giving students time, right? Mm -hmm. And they're here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they're very helpful and very useful and they have a passion for mentorship. And so you have to find those spaces, find those people, mm -hmm. and gradually you start to develop this network where even if they don't, can't help you directly, they can you know, uh, direct you to a place or, or someone that can help you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to realize very early, early on to start you know, that network, building that network, right? right. And, you, and, and I guess the hardest thing for a lot of undergraduates is that someone, when you're in high school, people told you what to do. People, you know, say, you need to do this, 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 and this. And now, no one's telling you what to do. Right. You know, you have to do these things on your own. Mm -hmm. And um, that can also be a challenge for some students, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Melissa, who was here in the, the interview before you, she said that, that one of the strategies that she uses is when she clicks with a professor, she would email that professor and say, hey, who are other professors mm -hmm. that you think I would like? Um, do you think that would be a good approach? I think that's one approach. That's definitely one approach. Um, I think, and that depends on the student. For, for, for me, um, my first year, I think I took the, uh, the opposite approach where mm -hmm. I was really just trying to put my head down and sort of get through school and mm -hmm. sort of, you know, push through by myself. Mm -hmm. But then I came to the realization that I, I can't do this by myself mm -hmm. and, you know, and I need help. And um, so that's one way, but, but also too, um, I would start, I started going to like some, you know, of the events on campus for African American students. Mm -hmm. And when you go to these events, you start to see the same faces, right? right. Um, and you strike up a conversation with those professors and, you know, talk about your interest and what it is you, and if, like I said, if they can't help you, then of course they're gonna direct you to someone else. Um, right. But I think 
opening yourself up and going to those spaces that are safe, right? Because mm -hmm. there are going to be people there who are there to help you and, and they want to help you. Right. But I, I, my, my advice would be to go to those safe spaces mm -hmm. because um, it's, it's an open environment. There's other students who are in the same situation you're in, right? right, right. And you can, you can meet those students and it also provides a safe space just to meet these professors and, mm -hmm. and they're very friendly, you know? Yeah, and I mean, there are so many different spaces on campus that can work in that way, right? Like the Cross-Cultural Center, you know, you go there, you see that there are tons of different student organizations right. for Asian American students, African American students, Latino students, um, first-gen students. You know, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Um, student Support Services, the Black Student Union, yeah. Mesa yeah. Unida, if you're Latino, right? Um, now, talking about grad school, because you're not just a first-gen undergrad, right? You're earning your PhD now. Yes. And I'm curious about the journey from being a first generation undergrad to getting the idea that you wanted to go to graduate school. How did that happen? Well, initially that wasn't even on my radar screen, right? It wasn't, I didn't think about graduate school. Um, my senior year um, at Morehouse, I had a couple professors who were pushing me in that direction. Mm -hmm. But at that time, um, I did not see myself as a professor, as a person going to get a PhD. Um, and I think my professors were a little bit disappointed that I chose not to go that route. Yeah. But there are also some other things going on too. I was burnt out from undergrad, you know, and I wanted to, to go out and make some money mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to travel, right? So I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to study abroad in Japan initially. Um, I didn't have the money, I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. But I had an opportunity to go to Japan and work. So I was like, hey, this is my time to go. So I wanted to go to Japan. And mm -hmm. then I, I went to China and what was supposed to be for maybe six months, a year, turned into like several years. Right. And um, I got sidetracked. Um, however, um, many years later, um, I revisited that, that, that thought about graduate school because um, I was working a job and I realized that it was a dead end, mm. that I couldn't go any further if I wanted to stay in higher education with just uh, you know, a bachelor's degree, mm -hmm. you know, that I had to go back to school. And uh, I went back for my master's because mm -hmm. um, um, I wasn't sure about this PhD, right? I, I, that was a big step, right? Let's take right. a small step first. Right. Um, so I went back for a master's degree in public administration. Mm -hmm. um, but there was still this, um, this need to do more because I still felt that even with a master's degree, if I wanted to stay in higher ed, that, that it was just a limit on what I could do mm -hmm. and what I wanted to do. And um, living in China at the time, um, I had these questions that I wanted to answer about Chinese history, mm -hmm. particularly um, as it concerned um, the relationship of uh, with African Americans to China, mm -hmm. and um, so I started doing some research and saying, "Well, maybe I can do this." And I contacted a few people in my network who were who are professors, mm -hmm. and um, they were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, a couple of them um, recommended uh, some various universities where they knew people, and UCI was one of those, and so mm -hmm. well, you talk to these people at, at UCI, and, and so I did that, and you know, we had great conversation, and it's well, you should apply, you know, and, and so I applied, and, um, and, and it worked out, and it worked out, um, and uh, I don't regret my decision. Um, of course, there was a lot of trepidation about, um, could I do the work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had been out of school for a very long time, and uh, you know, so not just only am I a first gen, but I'm also like a non-traditional graduate student mm -hmm. as well. You know, um, so uh, a lot of things were were really just sort of swimming in my head about coming back to graduate school, and I, I finally just made the leap, mm -hmm. and um, I think it was well worth it, definitely. So, we followed similar paths to graduate school. You know, I did my undergrad degree. I was certified as a teacher. I taught high school for a decade. Mm. Um, then I did a master's degree and taught for another couple of years and then finally took the leap and did a PhD. And I'm wondering if there are maybe a lot of other first-gen students who are talented mm -hmm. and maybe would enjoy 
the work and learning more, you know, being a graduate student, but somehow think that, you know, people like us, mm -hmm. first-gen students, people from low-income families, that, that we don't get to go to graduate mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. right? Um, so taking that non-traditional route, is, it's cool. You mm -hmm. know, it means mm -hmm. that we're really well-rounded people when right. we get here, and that's, that's a cool path for some people. But what would you say to UCI first-gen students who, you know, when they hear about graduate school, they think, oh, yeah, that's for other people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? What would you say to them? Well, I, I think that the great thing that needs to happen is that we need to really push our students into thinking that becoming a professor or getting an advanced degree is always been a, a part of our tradition. There, mm -hmm. there have always been, for me as an African American, there have always been African American PhDs. There have mm -hmm. always been African Americans who have been a part of the university system, you mm -hmm. know, um, in, in many different capacities. Mm -hmm. And so I think the first thing that I would say to students um, is that you belong, you know, you belong in this space. Mm -hmm. This is not a space just for other people. This mm -hmm. is a space that you belong. And I think that mentoring helps a great deal here because if you have professors who are constantly telling you your research is important, mm -hmm. what you're doing is important, your questions are important, you know, you're smart, mm -hmm. you can do, I mean, you're receiving all of this, um, you know, very uh, positive feedback about your place in, in the university space. I think that goes a long way for providing the confidence that mm -hmm. our students need to make that next move into graduate school. Of course, there's nothing wrong with their brains. There's nothing wrong with their capacity, their ability to do the work. It's there. Mm -hmm. It's all mentally just a, a matter of them not being confident, right? Right. So I think that that mentorship very early on from, you know, freshman year, saying, okay, pushing students, you can do this, do this, just pushing a little bit mm -hmm. and making them realize that, well, I, I can do this, you know, yeah. I can do really good work, I can do really good research. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that happening in, in uh, a lot of departments. I attend some of the undergraduate research symposiums on campus and I'm amazed at what some of these undergraduate students are doing mm -hmm. and, and a little bit jealous as well too because <laughs> I'm just like, well, I wasn't doing that when I was an undergrad. No, so um, it's, it's very refreshing to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel confident that um, we are moving towards uh, you know, a position where, where more students are understanding that they can do this research, right? That they mm -hmm. can contribute uh, to academia, and mm -hmm. I think we'll see more of that. But I think starting early on, we have to really, you know, like you said before, you know, I mean, when did you realize you wanted to go to university? Mm -hmm. We have to make these students realize very early on that, oh, you're going to graduate school. That's right. You know, you're going. Right. You know, and, and I'm going to get you there, and this is what you're going to do to get there. Right, and, and that there's money for it. Yes. Even if you are from a low-income background and you're working 20 hours a week to just buy your Ichiban noodles right, to right, make it right, through the right. week, right? That that there are there are funds yes. to get people yes. through graduate school. Yes. You, you know, you need to talk to your professors. You need to talk to graduate students, yes. right? Like find graduate students who are like you yeah. and ask them how they got there, right? Yeah. So final thoughts or words of advice or encouragement for our incoming first-gen students here at UC Irvine. Take advantage of your undergraduate years. Um, it's going to go by very quickly but set goals for yourself. Post those goals on a wall where you can see them every day. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, ask yourself, have I done something today that's driving me towards the completion of those goals that I've set? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, because only you can really, you can, you can fool other people, but right. you can't <laughs> fool yourself, right? right? If the answer is no, then you have to go back to the table and work harder, figure out what you're not doing mm -hmm. and, and make it happen. Right. Because um, no one's gonna push you like you're gonna push yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just take advantage of these years to really um, work towards some really concrete goals that are gonna help you in the future. All right, thanks Marquitas. Thank you, appreciate it.